Eternal Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be together and study your word. And I ask you to please bless my delivery of it, the message that you have given us. And so I pray that what I say will be by your authority and with your blessing on all of us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. C.S. Lewis described his father in his autobiography by saying that on the whole, he had fairly reasonable ideas when he initially thought of something. Then after he'd wrestled with it in his mind and he worked hard to resolve all the problems that might arise, and considering all the alternatives, he almost always decided on the worst solution. Well, in a lot of ways, that's all of our stories, I think. At least for me, it works. And when we come to the subject of God and what he requires and what we can do, we almost always get it backwards. And if we consider first Christ, our shepherd, let's use him for the example. You know, our Lord spoke to a lot of different groups when he was here on earth in the flesh. And as a kind of an early WWJD, one particular group, WWJD, you remember the what would Jesus do and the, the bracelets and the hats and everything from the Jesus, Jesus movement. Um, he addressed this one group that uh, took the concept of righteous living very seriously. You know, they disciplined their bodies so that their passions would not rule them. They gave to the poor, and they diligently read the scriptures and so on, and who could find fault with that? He also addressed another group, and that group lived in an immoral lifestyle. This group stole from one another, and they were not diligent for keeping commandments. And of the two, which do you think would find Jesus' favor and be more likely to end up in the kingdom of God? Well, I know you're already way ahead of me on this, but um, Jesus addressed the first group, the one that kept the commandments, and he said, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So, as I said, the first group that I mentioned, that holy group, those were the Pharisees, and the second were the harlots and the thieves. So, just like C.S. Lewis's father, um, we hear about those two groups, and oftentimes in worldly thinking, we would get backwards. Um, we think that those who strive to follow the religious example are the ones that Jesus would accept, while the sinners would be the ones that he rejects. But that's not the case. So what gives? I mean, how come? Now, is following Jesus' example wrong? Well, it's not, really. Um, he commands us to do it, as a matter of fact, as in, uh, there's a passage in 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 2, verses 19 through 21, it says, for it's commendable, for it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. But that's not of first importance. And everyone who thinks it is has gotten it backwards. Because just like the Pharisees, we can follow his example of conduct with our greatest diligence and not come a bit closer to heaven. Hmm. So what is necessary and what can we do? Well, in a word, Nothing. 
We'll come back to this after a while, but nothing? Does that mean that there is no hope for us? Well, no, there is hope. I wouldn't sit down and just leave you hanging out there saying, there's no hope, go home. This hope, the assurance, is going to be found in our gospel passage today. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Get that word good. Now, Jesus likens himself to a shepherd. And that's a metaphor. It's a metaphor that's ripe with meaning, especially considering God's history with Israel. And it's not the first time that that has been used, that kind of an image has been invoked. God has already declared himself as a shepherd to his people in various scriptures, like uh, Psalm 23, we can all think of that one, uh, Ezekiel 34. So why does Jesus go further in saying that he's the good shepherd, instead of just saying that he's the shepherd, as those other scriptures would say? Why does he add that word, that descriptor, the word good? Um, I would imagine most of you by now, it's a pretty old movie, but uh, you've seen the movie Forrest Gump. I think all of you probably have. But in one of the lines in that movie, Forrest Gump says, I may not be a smart man, but I know what love is. And as the movie unfolded, it did seem that Gump knew a lot about that one important point. But that movie may challenge us with the question, do you know what love is? And if so, how are you sure? It's also a good question to ponder in our cultural climate. You know, there's so many claims of love that are paraded around, um, and a lot of them are in really sharp contrast with one another. Um, so how do we arrive at the point that we, along with Forrest Gump, could say, I know what love is? For, well, luckily for believers, we don't have to come up with our own answer to that question. Thank you, God. <laughs> we trust that Jesus already revealed to us the deepest knowing of love by showing us the identity of his Father, who is love who is the source of love. Jesus doesn't just tell us what love is, although he does that as well, but he invites us into that love in a real and abiding way. Jesus extends the love of the Father to us, the very love that he has experienced and shared for all eternity in order that we can know God for who he is and participate in the love that he has for us and for others. It's only from that, from that basic grounding, from that basic point that we can truly say we know what love is, or maybe more accurately, we can say we know who love is. But just saying we know what love is doesn't really make it so. As we, as we look around our world today, we find plenty of people and organizations, movements, programs, and leaders, and other voices that claim they know what love is. And therefore, you should follow their example, their teaching, in order to be considered a loving person as well. Have you seen that displayed in the media around you? Like, whether it's the mainstream, uh, the news outlets, Hollywood movies, political figures, other sources that seem to um, say that they have the answer. And they also have a stake in that, virginal, uh, that virtual signaling. After all, no one's going to follow someone who admit, openly admits that they don't know what love is and don't have any idea. Wouldn't be very good for ratings, uh, for one thing. So, we're bombarded with messages of love from every corner of the world. 
but we have to be able to tell who's trustworthy and who's not trustworthy. And the only way to tell the difference is to know the real thing. For instance, when it comes to knowing the difference, um, do you know how to spot a $100 bill versus a counterfeit? I actually attended a meeting once with some Secret Service agents. Uh, I don't even remember what job or where I was working at the time, but they sent it to this thing because uh, there was a lot of counterfeit money that would come across the counters. And so um, they, they showed us. And you could still get fooled pretty easily. So um, don't, take, don't ask me to, um, to authenticate your $100 bills. I know that you all have several of those in your wallet right now. And, you know, don't worry. I, I can tell some things about it, but not much. <laughs> but there's a lot of things that, mask around, re, that masquerade as the real thing. And we need to be able to trust that what we're being told about love is true and in this text we can know that this is authentic because this is the words of Jesus himself in the text that we had today that's the gospel Jesus said this the one who came from the father the only one who can tell us what the love of the father really is because he's been with him for eternity now and we should be prepared to understand why he speaks in metaphors like this. Uh, he says, you know, it's a, it's a subject that's too deep to be contained in some rational or logical argument. That's like one of those things that can't translate from one language to another. Uh, you have to make, well, it's like this or like this. It's the reason that, that Jesus, that at many places in the Bible, uh, parables, metaphors are used in that way to convey an idea that can't be quantified in just a logical explanation or a direct translation. But we trust him because that he is the embodiment and living proof of that love. Or we could say there's another term that uh, you hear a lot and you hear it in music and everything else, but we know that this one was for real because Jesus doesn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk, as any of us who are trying to walk the walk realize it's not that easy. Now, that first sets up a distinction that needs to be considered when you're identifying your true shepherd of Israel from the other competing or counterfeit shepherds. This adjective good, which can also mean right, proper, honorable, and beautiful, um, that alerts us to the fact that there can be bad or wrong, improper, dishonorable, or downright ugly shepherds that parade around as angels of light. And we have to be able to tell the difference. And Jesus goes farther to help us discern the difference with the actions that will accompany a good shepherd. And that action is described as one who lays down his life for the sheep. You notice that in these eight verses that a reference to laying down one's own life appears five times. That clues us in on a major distinction between what constitutes a good shepherd and what does not. And second, by including the adjective good, Jesus is building our trust in him, him and the Father who sent him. We don't want to put our trust in just any old shepherd. We need to know that he's trustworthy, that he is good. And we don't want to follow a shepherd who's good in name only. You know, self-proclaimed labels are worthless. And the label has to match the reality that it indicates. So the authenticating and parallel action of a good shepherd is boldly proclaimed by the Lord as one who lays down his life for the sheep. That's a measurement that will definitely flush out any bad shepherds, the people who are in it for self-gain, and it's a high bar to reach. 
And then Jesus goes on further to describe in more detail what we can expect from a counterfeit shepherd. He's showing us where we're supposed to place our trust. In verses 12 and 13, it says, He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now, Jesus is not stretching that metaphor further than the Old Testament scriptures have already done because it's been used several times in the Old Testament. Throughout the biblical witness, we find a lot of images of shepherds that did not live up to the description of good. In Isaiah 56, for example, the rulers of God's people are described as shepherds who only care for themselves. They prefer getting drunk when they should be watching over the flock. In Jeremiah 10, Judah's leadership is referred to as stupid shepherds who allowed the scattering of God's sheep. And in Ezekiel 34, there's a denunciation given to the shepherds of Israel as they're accused of gorging themselves when they should have been feeding the sheep. They're not concerned for the health and safety of the sheep. In short, they don't love the sheep. Rather, they love their own power and control over the sheep that gets expressed with harshness and even violence. Jesus is not saying something new here. Maybe Jesus knows that we need the reminder that not all shepherds are good. Not all those who come proclaiming to protect and save us are trustworthy, and not all claims to love are, in fact, love at all. Maybe Jesus knows our tendency <laughs> to become naive and to be deceived. Even in his metaphor, he's serving as the good shepherd by giving a warning as a means of protecting us, protecting the sheep. You know, the contrast zeroes in on the fact that a good shepherd cares more for the sheep than he does for himself. He's willing to lay down his life for the good of the sheep. And we also see a contrast between a shepherd and a hired hand who sees this relationship with the sheep as a contract that can be made in null and void once the conditions change. Uh, on the other hand, the good shepherd who will lay down his sheep, a life for the sheep, is a clear presentation of the covenant God who has committed himself for the good of the people, even at great cost to himself. And further, the contrast uh, between a hired hand and a good shepherd hints towards the distinction between a relationship of works as opposed to a relationship of grace. It might be a good reminder at this point to say that Jesus is using a metaphor. Otherwise, logic would say that the hired hand should, by all accounts, save his own life. And let the wolf, wolf snatch a sheep or two. At least the hired hand would live to tend the sheep another day. After all, what good is a dead shepherd? Ah, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Let's look a little further and see what direction Jesus takes us in his metaphor. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and they know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. It would appear that Jesus is more concerned to use the metaphor to tell us that he, who he is than who the hired hands are. In other words, he wants us to know who he is and not the other guys. He again states that he's the good shepherd. And that statement is followed up with the claim that the shepherd knows his sheep and that the sheep know him. Also, the manner of his knowing 
this knowing between shepherd and sheep is, it's comparable to the way the father knows the son and the son knows the father, which is a startling claim. You know, especially if we take into account Jesus' words later in the chapter in verse uh, 38 of that same chapter, he says, the father is in me and I am in the father. And that's some very intimate knowing. So what do we make of that? Um, letting that metaphor take us beyond some literal relationship between shepherds and sheep, we're able to take Jesus' words about knowing as belonging to his claim of being the good shepherd. And this may shed some light on our previous question of what good is a dead shepherd. Uh, that would have been a pretty good question, except we know what we're talking about here is a little different. Um, if Jesus lays down his, shep for, his life for the sheep, now, wouldn't that open up the flock for attacks from the wolf? Or is he speaking of something deeper, something that, that um, qualifies him as the good shepherd? It's possible that Jesus wants to see him. He's the one who has enabled us to know the Father with the same knowing the Son has of the Father. In other words, he knows us, we know him, he knows the Father, and we're all being brought into it. Jesus is also the good shepherd in that he knows us as not just as a hired hand, because he's the one who lays down his life and he can identify with the sheep that's been snatched by the wolf. He's speaking way deeper about what good he brings to the sheep in his laying down of his life than some literal protection from death. Because it's the death of the good shepherd that has brought the sheep into the fold of life. And into the love of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. And as G Jesus indicates, he's bringing other sheep into that fold as well. And that's where we come full circle with our discussion about knowing what love is. Because we can wrap up with these last two verses. It says, For this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. That's a charge I have received from my Father. So, notice how closely related or interrelated Jesus and his Father are in Jesus laying down his life for the sheep. They're both operating out of the same love. We are to see that the Father loves us in the same way he loves his own Son. And the Son is loving us by the authority of the Father's love. There's no difference between the Father's love for us and the love we see in Jesus, the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd who lays down his life for us. And that love seeks to bring us into an intimate relationship of knowing the Father through the Son and by the Spirit. This is what gives Jesus the distinction of being the Good Shepherd. Our greatest good is to be brought into that relationship with the Father where we know Him and are known by Him. John later writes of this description of eternal life. He says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's in John 17, verse 3. <clears throat> we can't end there. Jesus also mentions this in the closing verse, that he not only lays his life down, but also that he may take it up again. And with that statement, we're reminded of what we've been celebrating since Easter. We're still in that season because our good shepherd is a risen shepherd and he's still shepherding you and me. Even in this text to know him, 
we in this text know him and his father more. He's continuing to love us with the very love the Father has for him, so we too can come to rest in the assurance of knowing what love is. The Good Shepherd is still warning us and guarding us against the hired hands, the ones who do not have our best interest in mind, the ones who would sell us out to the wolf at the first sight of cost to themselves. We have a good shepherd. Indeed, we have a good shepherd. Through his death and resurrection, he's brought us into the one fold of belonging to the one truly good shepherd. So what good is a dead shepherd? His goodness lies in the truth of who he is. He's the one who knows us as one of the sheep all the way from birth to death. When John writes of the crucifixion of Jesus, he portrays Jesus as the Passover lamb. And this dead shepherd, however, lives and reigns, as John would later pen in the book of Revelation, the lamb standing as though it had been slain. This reigning shepherd is our king, reigning in the goodness of who he is as the son of the father who knows what love is. And he lives to bring us into a loving relation and knowing relationship with himself and his father and to participate in the covenant love that never will leave us or forsake us. Listen, people, Christ knows his sheep. That's why it is that it's what he does and not what you do. Remember way back in there when I said there's nothing we can do? <laughs> We're coming back to that. It's what he does, not what you do, that makes the difference with God. He saves us and makes sure it is so rather than simply giving us the tools to save ourselves. Just like C.S. Lewis's father, we get that mixed up. We think if we have the right tools and say the right prayer and follow his example that we're saved from hell. And that's not true. We are only saved by his death for us. And that death is not that fact, death is effective for the whole world, but it's effective for us by God's gracious decision. Once God has given us the faith to believe in this death for our sins, he also gives us the Holy Spirit who changes us. So we begin like a little child to follow the example of our Savior and our Shepherd. But well, let's never get the order mixed up. Let's thank God that first Christ knows his sheep and that he died for us. Amen? Amen.